they got to see a different side because they saw West Berlin through my eyes and the way I viewed West Berlin always. So, so they, 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 their version of West Berlin was completely different to mine. I, I'm English. I could. I looked at everything cynically. You know, Germans. Hmm, you know, uh, always the question mark, right? So, so uh, the, the, they got to see. West Berlin through my eyes, which I think was for them also quite an eye-opener. And a lot of people didn't even know that our scene existed, even though they live in the same city, even though they everyday life, you know, they, they, never, they weren't even aware that this scene was in existence, even though they lived there, because yeah? it was the underground. <laughs> И ответ такой, что они увидели другую сторону э, его глазами. Э, и он британец, и он видел все это совсем иначе. Э, он мог посмотреть на это более цинично. Э, и во многом тот взгляд, который он показал им, э, это было для них тоже своего рода открытием, потому что многие, даже те, кто э, жил в этом городе, практически ничего об этом не знали, потому что это был андеграунд, и это было скрыто от глаз жизнь, поэтому для многих этот фильм uh, показал какой-то новый взгляд на неизвестные вещи. The people who lived in East Berlin, they didn't know anything about West Berlin at all. Because they, the only things that they saw were on TV. That was the only access to West Berlin was through TV, West Berlin TV. But they actually didn't really know anything at all. So when they got to see it, you know, that the, they were East Berliners crying watching this movie because they realized all these things that they never got to see. Don't give us another shot to watch this amazing film. <laughs> have any sounds from the East come through the wall? So, were there any artists or bands from Soviet Union you had a chance to hear at the time? Никали не звуки с востока в западный Берлин. Были ли какие-либо группы, которые или артисты, которых вы могли услышать? I'm sorry. <laughs> so which ones? East Bank. Okay. Yeah, East Bank. He was, I, I think, he was from Lithuania or from Latvia. Yeah. Be. He 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 came to Berlin, and there were a couple of other artists uh, 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 from. Uh, I can't remember the names, like Dubrava or someone like this. Yeah, they came yeah. from. Yeah, they came from from Soviet Union, and I, I got to see these people perform in, in West Berlin. So Berlin has become a kind of an island of freedom for me, my friends, and other Russians right now. And what do you think about Berlin right now? Is it does it have the same atmosphere as it had before, or has it changed completely? Well, obviously Berlin's changed, you know, it's West Berlin no longer exists, East Berlin no longer exists, it's become one city. For, for me it's always been one city, actually. So for me personally it's not changed very much in, in a lot of ways. It still attracts the same kind of people to Berlin, right? Um, Berlin was always this kind of place where it was like a refugee place, really. It was a place of refuge. It was a place where people who felt in their own villages or their own towns, they feel, felt like an outcast or they felt they were being bullied or, you know, they, they, they could just go to Berlin and they would feel other people that were in the same situation as they were. So everyone felt kind of like together in that respect. And Berlin is still like that. It still attracts the same kind of people to, to its shores, you know. And, and I think that that is uh, the, the, the fundamental aspect of Berlin. It's, the, it's a place where you can discover yourself, Berlin. And it's always been that. It's like, you know, you went, I, I went to Berlin not knowing anything about myself, really, until I actually got there and, reali and realized what what things were when I got to Berlin. And once, I, once I, I, I was able to cross into the East and I realized what I had in the West, 
then I started to realise things about myself. And, and, and I think that's what Berlin really is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place of discovery. It's a place of discovery about yourself. Когда я поехала сначала через Восточную Европу и потом приехала на Запад, я очень много узнала о себе. Так что да, мне кажется, что Берлин это место для открытий, в первую очередь для открытия самого себя. Hello. Uh, I actually have just one question. Do you still like to dress up? Do I still like to dress up? Yes. No. No? Why? <laughs> of course I like to dress up. I always dress up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> don't, don't be worried about that, you know. <laughs> У меня есть только один вопрос. Нравится ли вам все еще наряжаться? I don't know how to... No. Uh, it's, it's like it's like I don't, I don't consider it as be, as dressing up, right? <laughs> uh, it's my everyday attire. Yeah, <laughs> for me, it's it's what I like to wear and how I feel comfortable. So, you know, I, I don't consider it dressing up as such. So. Да, конечно, я продолжаю это делать, но для меня это не что-то необычное. Это просто то, как я обычно одеваюсь, для меня это удобно. Так что я не называю это нарядом или каким-то специальным. You didn't just smuggle cassettes into Israel. You want to smuggle, smuggle to the East Berlin uniform to the border. Isn't that true? Yes. We smuggled in the East Berlin uniform to the border. Isn't that true? Yes. We smuggled in the East Berlin uniform to the border. Isn't that true? Yes. We smuggled in the East Berlin uniform to the border. Isn't that true? Yes. We smuggled in the East Berlin uniform to the border. Isn't that true? Yes. A uniform. Uh, he liberated it off somebody, I think, right? Now, in in the East, a, any country of the East, your, your uniform, you were given a uniform and it had your number in it and that was it, yeah? And and y y you couldn't go to a shop and buy an East German Army uniform or a Russian uniform for that matter. You, you, you know, you got given it and that was it. And he had acquired this uniform and he said to me here I've got your uniform and, and it was the entire uniform it was everything yeah it was the boots it was the helmet it was ev everything I'm like wow you know and and they had a, a camouflage uniform with a one stripe like a very small stripe it's called one stripe no stripe uniform and I really like this I thought oh that'd be really cool to go on tour with you know so I decided I would smuggle this back to West Berlin and I, I, my friends are going like how are you going to get this over the border because you can't just go with it in a, in a bag and then go to the border <laughs> I've got a uniform. you know it's like it wasn't going to happen so so I, I decided to wear it underneath my normal clothes <laughs> and my friends looked at me and were like no fucking way we're not going to go over the border with you looking like that you look like Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> Like bot the body of Arnold Schwarzenegger with his pin head on the top. It's like it's not gonna. So I thought well, I, I'll give it a go. You know, N if I got caught, I, I, I dread to think what would have happened if I got caught. But I, I, I decided to wear this anyway un under my clothes. And I got to the we got to the border and I bought a bottle of vodka and I poured half the bottle of vodka away and I drank the other bit and I, and I went to the border and pretended I was really drunk. And the border guard saw this horrific like sight of a, a drunken, I was by this best time I was right, bright red because this uniform was really hot underneath my clothes. Right? So I had a bright red face and I was pretending to be really drunk and he just went go, 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 go. <laughs> And, I, and I, but there's two other border crossings to go through. It's what, that was just the first one, yeah. And then the second one, there was a, it was the customs control, and the customs controller was sitting there, and he just watched me staggering towards him, and he just went like that, go away, go away. 
because I wanted to put at the back of the gills, I wanted to put these like red banners, you know, like red flags. I thought it looked very cool with them in their black outfits and red lipstick and these kind of red banners, right? So we'd ordered some red flag material from the red flag material propaganda shop in East Berlin. And we went there and we bought this big bundle of like 20 odd meters of red flag material. And it was wrapped in this kind of right thin brown paper with a small piece of string around it. And my friend Alistair, who was the singer of the Umbicant, and he, he, he decided he'd carry that because it's safe. It's just red flag material. And, and I went in front of him and he just watched me go down the stairs into the, this pit of like, you know, the border. And then he came down behind me. And as he got on, he just put one foot on the step and then this bag with this material just burst open and all this material kind of cascaded down the st staircase. And I was thinking, if, if, you, want, if you wanted to attract, attract attention anymore, you couldn't have done anything better than that, right? All these border guards come running towards him and start dragging him off. And he was looking, he was passing me, he was going like, that's going looking like, like no. he wasn't pointing, but he was kind of like insinuating with his eyes, like, look, look down. And I looked down at my, my trousers and this East German army uniform, which was a little bit too long for my child was hanging at the bottom like this and I'm thinking oh god if they see that then I'm gonna be bit like breaking stones in some gulag somewhere you know <laughs> and, and I'm like oh what am I gonna do and in front of me these two Lebanese guys started having this argument and they started to attract real attention to the border guards you having this big argument and the border guards came and they kind of surround they right in front of me you know and I'm just thinking if one of these guards just takes a look down at me and sees this uh, they're going to be dragging me off you know but unfortunately for me I, I managed to escape and get through the border and come back to West Berlin and and then I waited for like four hours for my friend Alistair to who was being interrogated by these Germans, what, what he was doing with all this red flag material, and, and I managed to get away. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Translate that. Okay. Когда мы говорим про контрабанду формы, важно понимать, что ее было довольно трудно купить, потому что форма нигде не продавалась, ее только выдавали военным, она шла строго под номерами, но друг Марка смог где-то купить форму, это было полное амбулантирование, и он принес ему и подарил. И Марк решил, что будет классно контрабандой провести ее. Но было непонятно, как это сделать, и он в итоге решил принести ее на себе под своей одеждой. Его друзья сказали, что это абсолютно безумная идея, и они отказываются в этом участвовать, и что это будет очень заметно, и его тут же разоблачат. Но он решил все-таки это сделать. У него была с собой бутылка водки. Он к моменту, когда там было несколько пунктов проходных, которые нужно было преодолеть, и к первой границе он выпил половину бутылки водки и притворился невероятно пьяным. У него был яркий румянец и от водки, и от того, что несколько слоев одежды, и от этого было очень жарко. И когда пограничники увидели, что у него половина бутылки, и он шатается, и он пьяный, не сказали ему, ладно, просто скорее проходи. И все было ничего, но была еще вторая граница, которую нужно было перейти. С ним был его друг, который нес материал для красного флага, потому что они хотели, чтобы группа Малария выступала вместе с ним, и они подумали, что это будет классно сценический номер, если они все будут одеты в черные, а сзади будет э, красный флаг. И флаг был, это была огромная многометровая э, материя, он был завернут в черную оберточную бумагу, и друг подумал, что э, ну, в этом нет ничего страшного, и он легко может это провести. Но когда они проходили границу, э, его сумка упала, и флаг э, развернулся, и они тут же обратили на него внимание, потому что была огромная красная ткань, и все внимание пограничников было на нем. 
И тут Марк понял, что он как бы посмотрел вниз и увидел, что из-под его штанины видна э, форма, которую он пытался прятать, и он понял, что если вдруг кто-то из пограничников э, опустит взгляд тоже чуть-чуть ниже, то, скорее всего, ему переломают кости в ГУЛАГе, и он стал очень э, волноваться. Э, но в итоге э, кто-то из его друзей отвлек внимание пограничников, и он смог очень быстро преодолеть эту границу, и потом 4 часа ждал, пока э, отпустит его друга, которого все это время э, допрашивали э, о том, зачем ему был красный флаг и что он собирался с ним делать. On the cutting edge of uh, different music styles, like you were with new wave, with electronic music, uh, with techno, and later with uh, trans music. So now you're promoting this band called Stolen, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think there's a kind of a new energy coming from the east, maybe? Do you think like maybe China could be the new uh, mecca for music, something like that? Я, я имел в виду, что а, Марк всегда а, находится на острие и всегда а, новые стили, такие как New Wave, электронная музыка, техно и транс-музыка, а, всегда а, он их старался подвигать. И сейчас, а, а, в последнее время, он а, ну, не менеджером является, но подвигает как бы, группу, которая называется Stolen. Stolen. И как раз хотел узнать его мнение, думает ли он о том, что а, такая группа из Китая, Uh, является ли Китай новый мех для, может быть, музыки, электронной музыки в целом? Uh -huh. Спасибо. Спасибо. Стоулен are just the spearhead of the next generation for 2020. The 2020s, which will be the roaring 2020s. It's, it's global underground. It's not just about one thing. It's not just about one place. It's not like, but in the past you had, you know, everything came from America, everything came from the UK, and then it moved to Germany in the 90s with techno. We've had 30 years of techno. That's, that's somebody's life, right? It's time for a change. It's time to change our perceptions and change our, our you know, give, give these young people who are trying so hard uh, to give them a platform and give them a chance. And I saw that in Stolen. Just the fact that they come from China, it's because it's very, it's a very, very difficult situation that they're in, right? It's like, it's just like in sort of like the communist East of the 80s, maybe in a way, because they have to have their, their lyrics checked by the state censor and things like this. They can't just go anywhere, you know? So I chose them as the kind of the vehicle and as the spearhead of, of, of what I consider to be the global underground, which stretches from China to America and has everybody in between. And even here, even in, in, in Holland or in England, anywhere, France, you know, whole of Europe, they're everywhere, these young people who are not being given the opportunity and I wanted to show that there is an opportunity, that you, you can do this and you, there is a platform and it's your time now. Because, you know, uh, how do people want to be seen in the 2020s? You know, let me look back at the, 20, the first 20 years of the 21st century. What does that have to offer? What new things did we bring to the table in the, that period. We know what happened for in the 90s, you know, te techno happened in the 90s, but techno also transformed itself through the 90s into the first 20 years of the 21st century and it's not really going anywhere. So let's give other people the opportunity and this time it's with a touch of a button. It's not just like before where, where it was only one country doing it. It is global at the same time. And stolen are just part of that picture. Thank you. Можно сказать, что стол находится на острие этого течения, и я думаю, они это то прогрессивное, что будет с нами в 2020-х и дальше. И если раньше э, все шло из Америки или из Британии, то теперь, я думаю, время изменить это. 
И мне кажется, пришло время дать молодым людям, которые так стараются, наконец, возможность э, распространить их музыку, их идеи. И здесь речь идет не только об одной э, группе, а о неком глобальном андеграунде, который уже наступает. И очень здесь важен тот факт, что они из Китая, э, из-за их политической системы. Отчасти это можно сравнить э, с тем, что происходило в Восточной Европе в 80-е. У них нет таких же возможностей, у них нет полной э, свободы творчества и свободы передвижения, и поэтому это особенно важно. И это молодые люди, у которых кажется, что нет возможности, но я хочу сказать им, я хочу показать, что возможности есть, и есть такая платформа, и сейчас их время, это время наступает, и нам уже пора думать о том, что произойдет в 2020-е, что будет сейчас в этом веке. Техно появилась в 80-е, и оно развивалось, и... Оно было популярно первые 20 лет 21 века, но пришло время двигаться дальше и что-то менять. И да, Столлен — это пример глобального андеграунда, и я думаю, что сейчас многое изменится. I think quite different <laughs> in a way. And uh, I want to know, do you think that there's a generation's gap between us? Maybe um, your point of view about how, uh, in which way we are different, maybe. Uh, Во-первых, спасибо вам огромное за фильм. Uh, фильм чудесный и вы чудесный. Во-вторых, мой вопрос таков. Очевидно, что это фильм о юности, об эмоциях и о попытках, об отчаянных попытках выразить себя для молодежи в тот период. И если посмотреть на аудиторию, то здесь довольно молодые люди. Думаете ли вы, что между той молодежью и молодежью, которая есть сейчас, существует некоторый поколенческий разрыв? Um, I, I don't think there's that much of a gap, to be honest. I think that as the world transforms itself, um, we're put into a position whereby we're all kind of put in the same kind of position as we were back in the 80s. You know, like when, when the wall came down, we all believed that was the end of the Cold War, that was the end of hostilities between East and West, that was the, the end of this um, threat of nuclear holocaust, which hung over our shoulders every single day. I, I never thought I'd live beyond 35. I thought I'd be dead by 35. I thought we'd all be exterminated in some kind of nuclear holocaust. I, I thought that West Berlin was the safest place. Yeah, that, that, that if anything was going to happen, that would be the last place, and I still believe it is. Uh, it's, it's, but the, you know, the, the way the world is changing, it's forcing us all to go back into those times, in a sense, and all the obstacles that are put in front of us. Um, it's just the way we get around those obstacles which matters, you know, it, and that's what makes it successful and that's what, what makes it thrilling and that's what makes it adventurous and that's what makes it creative because once you, something's put in front of you, to get around that you have to be creative and find a way to get around it and that's where you are at right now and, and I think that, 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 that in that respect you are not so far away from what we had in the 80s in West Berlin. Спасибо. Uh, честно говоря, я не думаю, что есть такой же большой разрыв uh, между нами и вами. Uh, мир сильно меняется, и в каком-то смысле можно сказать, что мы... Ну, есть некоторая параллель между тем, что происходило в 80-е, uh, когда у нас была холодная война и 
ядерный холокост. И, если честно, я не был уверен, что переживу свои 45. При том, что я был уверен, что Западный Берлин — это самое безопасное место на планете, и если что-то и произойдет, то до Западного Берлина это доберется в последнюю очередь. Я все равно, все равно не думал, что я смогу дожить до старости. Но то, что происходит сейчас, мир очень быстро меняется, и появляются все новые и новые препятствия. И важно то, как мы их преодолеваем. И для того, чтобы их преодолевать, нужно быть креативным и придумывать какие-то новые пути. И в этом отношении то, с чем сталкиваетесь вы сейчас, и ну, с какими препятствиями, я не думаю, что мы сильно отличаемся ну, в количестве этих препятствий, поскольку вам тоже приходится как-то их преодолевать. Dies. So, you know, you just have to remember that. D don't give up. Never surrender. То, что вам важно помнить, это то, что ничто не вечно, и всему приходит конец. Поэтому не сдавайтесь. Да, не сдавайтесь. Uh, hello, Mark. Uh, come here, uh, listen here. Uh, in, I've been uh, in trying a club to get in. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, this is all, I won't be uh, able to translate that. <laughs> uh, мы в, в прошлом году мы с вами виделись в одном маленьком клубе, а, и я вам рассказывал, что в Москве сейчас последние годы происходит очень интересно, что uh, последние два года похоже, как будто этот Западный Берлин тогда, 80-е годы, и um, Потом мы с вами списывались в Фейсбуке, я вам назвал несколько таких мест интересных в Москве. А скажите, вам удалось побывать в каком-нибудь, ну, когда те люди захватывают старые заводы, гаражи, делают самодельные клубы, вообще, ну, такая даже не анархия, а вот именно действительно похоже... Uh, все это действительно происходит, с, с, ну, люди сами это делают, без всяких, ну, как бы, без, так сказать, не, не, не думая вообще о государстве, не, не, даже, в общем-то, несмотря на то, что городские власти вообще как будто бы не знают об этом, действительно, так сказать, все эти места стараются не замещать, но это очень интересно, это очень интересные клубы. А удалось ли вам где-нибудь побывать за этот год? Вот из тех мест, которые я вам тогда писал. Хотите сказать это по-немецки или я могу перевести на английский? Окей. Да, so uh, the, the question is, um, he says that last year uh, um, you met in a, in a little club and then you also had some conversation um, on Facebook. Um, and he's saying that in Moscow, um, last year is happening something that is more or less, that like basically looks like um, West Berlin in the 90s. Mm. And there are a lot of different places that look more or less alike. It could be um, like old garage or, or old clubs and people are just, um, I don't know, taking it. And uh, it looks a little bit like anarchy but maybe this is not the right word so um there are a lot of lot of different places and he, he he's saying that um he gave you a couple of names and he's wondering whether you managed to visit any of them no. and it's not, oh, okay, so <laughs> unfortunately what was your what was your opinion about that but yeah but i didn't get to ch i didn't get a chance but, but i remember i remember him talking about this yeah i remember i remember that yeah i mean i i i i unfortunately don't get to to spend so much time here so i've not had a chance to to you know experience any of these other places tonight I'm DJing, yeah, if you want to come to the party tonight, I'm, I'm uh, pl playing at two o'clock in, uh, yeah, in, uh, in the paint factory, yeah, in the Fabrique. This is a small part of all the buildings in Moscow, Moscow underground clubs. Yeah, it's a small bit, I know, yeah, I know. You, you've got a very big city, you know. <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah, it's like ten times the size of Berlin. 
ответ был, что да, он помнит эту переписку, но, к сожалению, он, это не такая долгая поездка, и он еще не успел нигде побывать, но сегодня ночью он будет играть на фабрике, так что... На бумажной фабрике. На бумажной фабрике. Бумажная. Бумажная фабрика. Спасибо. На бумажной фабрике. Можно прийти, если будет какой-то, наверное, похожий опыт. Добрый вечер, Марк. Добрый вечер. Хочу еще раз поблагодарить вас за фильм. Было очень интересно посмотреть. Вы прекрасно выглядите, у вас сияют глаза, и улыбка не сходит с лица. Это очень приятно посмотреть, такой счастливый человек. И хочется очень спросить у вас, поддерживаете ли вы отношения с Бликс и Штурзерами Балтом? Чем они сейчас занимаются и как скоро они планируют посетить Россию, Москву? Потому что мы очень ждем их с поддержкой. Спасибо. Um, okay, so first of all, thank you for the movie, that was very interesting. Secondly, um, for saying that you look amazing and, <laughs> and your eyes are shining and you're smiling and I'm just really happy to see such a happy man. Um, and the question is um, whether you still communicate with... Uh, Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, whether you still communicate with Blixa, right? Um, and if um, if they're planning to, what are their plans? And if they're ever planning to come to Moscow? Well, I, uh, well, I, I, I see Blixa not like every day or anything like this. You know, I, I'm still in contact with Blixa. We still see each other occasionally. They just made a new album, actually. Yeah, and and whether they'll come to Moscow depends on whether they get invited to Moscow. <laughs> yeah, so it, you know they could come as tourists, but uh, if they're going to play, they'll get it, have to be invited. So. <laughs> Ответ был, что да, они, они поддерживают э, контакты, да, они видятся, может быть, не каждый день, но довольно часто. Э, и они сейчас работают над новым альбомом. И тот факт, э, приедут они в Москву или не приедут, зависит от того, пригласят их или не пригласят. Вот, и, наверное, это звучит как э, предложение или что-то. Я был в Ликсе в Сербии. Yeah, uh, oh, sorry, in Croatia. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we we did a talk together. In, mm -hmm. in that was the last time I saw Blix. Uh, in the past year, there was a concert in Croatia. Hello. Uh, can you please tell some interesting facts uh, about uh, young Curtis of Joy Division? What he was like? Interesting facts. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about Ian Curtis is that everyone has this impression that Ian Curtis was really depressed and depressive and kind of like always in this kind of like psychological inner turmoil and the Ian Curtis that I knew we all actually we all knew a different Ian Curtis. Deborah Curtis knew her husband Ian Curtis was a different Ian Curtis to the Ian Curtis that Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook and Stephen Morris knew, and it was a different Ian Curtis to, that, that I knew because I knew Ian Curtis from before he was even in Joy Division. He was in a, working in a record shop. And he was the only person who would talk to me because I was a kid and he was a young guy working in a record shop and no one else had served me, only he would. And I got to know him. He was only a few years older than me, Ian, but I got to know him through that. We talk about, we talk about things that had nothing to do with music most of the time. We talk about the war, 
and about you know the, about history and 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 mysticism and things like this and you know books whatever and and so so I, I knew a very very different Ian Curtis and and Ian was always fascinated by suicide and I think that Ian had always fantasized, fantasized about suicide in his mind he'd always fantasized about suicide he always he, he always thought that was the honorable way out if something was going to go wrong if, you know you committed suicide that would be the on, that's the way that's the only way so when he actually actually did it I was I was very shocked of course but I wasn't exactly surprised that he'd done that because that was the honourable way out in his eyes. That was the only way out. And so, so that, that was the Ian Curtis that I knew. I teach him a lot of different Ian Curtis, and I usually imagine him as very depressive. But I knew a different Curtis, and Debora, his wife, knew a different Curtis, and Peter Hook. Тоже знал своего Кертиса, и э, у многих был разный образ, но я знал его еще даже до того, как он э, стал частью Joy Division. Он работал в магазине пластинок, э, но был молодым парнем, я был почти ребенком, он был старше меня на пару лет, но я был практически единственным, кто приходил туда, и мы постоянно болтали, мы болтали даже не о музыке, а скорее о каких-то других вещах, о мистицизме, об истории, о книгах. И он всегда был заворожен суицидом, и это казалось ему достойным выходом, и как будто бы единственным выходом из этого мира. И когда я узнал о его суициде, я был... Я был шокирован, конечно, но можно сказать, что я не был удивлен, потому что я в, как в каком-то смысле знал, что так будет. Привет, Марк. Я помню, как смотрел фильм в 15 году и вышел с таким ощущением, что это очень-очень круто. Вот, как было сказано в фильме «Гея». У меня есть пару вопросов о сцене, о музыкальной сцене Берлина начала 80-х, вот очень интересно, что служило таким мотивом, как формирование столько уникальной музыкальной сцены и таких интересных артистов. И второй вопрос, это уже о сегодняшних днях, ходите ли вы, ходите ли вы на концерты и, ну, в Берлине, и куда и на что? Hi, Mark. Um, I've, uh, I saw the movie back in uh, 2015, uh, first time, and then I went out with uh, a feeling that that was really awesome, uh, or as we can say in German, Gail. Um, and so uh, I have a couple of questions about um, the musical scene of Berlin uh, in the beginning of the 80s. Um, what is your opinion what, like, what were the reasons of such a unique um, artist and such unique music back in those times? Um, and second question is whether um, do you go to any concerts in Berlin now? And if yes, then who are those people and uh, where, where to? Okay. Um, the, 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 the fact that Gudrun Gott, who worked in a record shop, she was really the instigator of everything, really, because she was she worked in a little record shop that sold English records, this punk music that was coming from the UK, and she was like she she wanted to also express herself in some way. Now, we had no real kind of punk rock. So when I actually arrived in Berlin in nineteen, I actually arrived in nineteen seventy eight. I uh, there wasn't there wasn't any kind of punk rock scene to kind of talk about really. They had two punk bands. On, I discovered uh, one was called PVC and the other one was called Tempo. They, they weren't very good, but at least they had something starting. And um, 
when I met Gudrun, she was working in this record shop, and, they, and the, this record shop only sold English punk rock records and new wave records, and she wanted to do something similar. She was, she was um, enthused by the idea that you could just do it yourself. She had virtually a new band every week, and she was doing something with somebody, you know. And, uh, and it was always girls, yeah. And apart from Eintracht Stutz and the Neubauten, which she started together with Blixer Bargeld. Uh, but their musical differences drove them apart and she started a, her own band called Mania Day and I went to see this band and I realised they couldn't play, they couldn't play their instruments, they, but they just did it and, and, and they, they broke all the rules of rock and roll that I'd known because I came from Manchester and I'd seen all this kind of like 60s pop music from the Beatles right down through 70s progressive rock and Yes and Pink Floyd and everything and suddenly we had punk rock and people made punk rock in Manchester to escape from Manchester and when I got to Berlin I realised that everybody who lived in Berlin, all the men they'd all escaped from West Germany because they didn't want to go to the German army and they had to do something and so they started to make music and started to make art and do things in that kind of creative world because that, at that moment it kind of, op kind of gave the opportunity. The, the, Berlin wasn't known as a musical city. Berlin was known as a political city, East versus West. Uh, David Bowie came to Berlin and put Berlin a little bit on the musical map by showing that that music, you know, could be something interesting in Berlin. Something was happening, this kind of tangerine dream thing, you know, and and that was kind of inspiring to me. And when I went, I only went to to Berlin to buy records. I, di I didn't intend on staying in Berlin. I just went to buy some records, and I never left, and I'm still there. And it's like the the, the this thing that I saw from Gudrun was so different to what I was used to. And from that was born this, what is known today as the Geniale Dilettanten scene. And this was just all these people who really couldn't play any instruments, but they, could, they just wanted to express themselves. And they, and they didn't need to escape anywhere because they'd already escaped to Berlin. So it made it a very different scenario for a, de a development of a certain kind of music. We called it the Berliner Krankheit, yeah? Berlin sickness, because it was a, a different kind of approach to making music. It wasn't about selling records, it wasn't about making money, it was about expressing yourself, and we didn't care. We all thought, like I said before, we all thought we were gonna die next week, so we decided just do it. Get, you know, express yourself any way you could. And, and that was the thing which kind of drove our little scene. It was only later in the middle, middle of the 80s when people th realised they could actually make money. <laughs> We've run out of time. <laughs> right you want <laughs> <laughs> Nice, eh? <laughs>